Hello, welcome to this mini lecture on blood glucose regulation. The level of glucose in the blood of a healthy person remains surprisingly stable throughout the course of the day, as shown here in this graph, where uh, for a healthy person, every hour their blood glucose was measured. You see a small rise after breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but then the level of glucose in the blood drops back down to the range of 80 to 100 mg per deciliter. In the remainder of this lecture, we'll talk about why it's important to maintain the appropriate blood glucose level and what types of mechanisms are at play that allow for this uh, glucose homeostasis. Our brains need glucose in order to function properly, and therefore low blood glucose or hypoglycemia is very dangerous. If the levels of glucose in our blood drop below about 70 mg per deciliter, we start feeling signs uh, of jitteriness, hangry, sweating, and uh, those are associated with release of epinephrine um, and, or an autonomic response. If levels of glucose continue to drop even lower, then our brain starts being starved for glucose, and we have what's called a neuroglycopenic response. Uh, and that can be very serious, resulting in seizures, coma, and eventually death. Blood glucose levels that are too high are also dangerous, and we call this diabetes mellitus, or just diabetes. This image shows three different ways of measuring blood glucose levels to um, diagnose diabetes, either fasting blood glucose, an oral glucose tolerance test, or the percent HbA1c or he, uh, glycated hemoglobin in the blood. And these images show the levels from each test by which we define diabetes. Glucose is a reactive molecule that can covalently attach to other molecules in our body. As shown here, that glucose will covalently attach to the N termini of the beta chains of hemoglobin, or adult hemoglobin, hemoglobin A. And we call this form HbA1c, or just A1c. The percent of hemoglobin that has glucose attached to it is linearly dependent on the average blood glucose concentration, as shown in the graph here. Glycated hemoglobin, or A1c, delivers oxygen just fine, but it is a nice clinical tool. Because red blood cells last for two to three months, the, uh, the percent A1c tells us about the average blood glucose level. So we define somebody as having diabetes mellitus if their HbA1c is 6.5% or higher. And we can calculate an estimated average blood glucose concentration based on the A1c. For example, an A1c of 7% correlates with an estimated average blood glucose level of 154 mg per deciliter. This image summarizes the acute symptoms of hypo and hyperglycemia. You may have felt some of the minor symptoms of hypoglycemia if you haven't eaten for a while. But chances are you've never experienced hyperglycemia unless you have diabetes. We, you should know for hyperglycemia that the kidney can only re reabsorb a certain amount of glucose. And if the blood glucose level goes above that level, then the osmotically active glucose ends up in the urine, pulling water with, us, wa water with it, causing us to have to urinate more often, and increasing our thirst and feeling of dryness as well as weakness. Severe hypoglycemia is acutely deadly, as well as extreme hyperglycemia, causing either diabetic ketoacidosis or a hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state. Blood glucose levels about, above about 100 mg per deciliter chronically also causes damage throughout the body, as summarized here. There are problems in the microvasculature affecting the eye, kidney, and nerves, as well as the macrovasculature affecting brain, heart, and extremities. Okay, so far we've seen that we need to regulate the concentration of glucose in our blood to a relatively narrow range between about 70 and 100 mg per deciliter throughout the day.
that means that we, our, our bodies have to be able to control how much glucose from dietary carbohydrates and the glucose released from the liver. Make sure that's very tightly balanced with the amount of glucose taken up from the blood into the cells of our bodies. Let's start by talking about how glucose exits the blood and enters the cells of our body. And this is through specific glucose transporters, or glutes, four of whom are described on this table. GLUT1 is expressed ubiquitously, meaning that essentially every cell type in our body has this glucose transporter. It is not regulated by insulin. It's called constitutive. It is always present. Red blood cells and the blood-brain barrier only have GLUT1, and so they're very dependent on this glucose transporter. GLUT2 is particularly expressed in the cell types that are important for regulating blood glucose, such as hepatocytes, the endocrine pancreas, like pancreatic beta cells, as well as the intestinal enterocytes. It has a low affinity for glucose, meaning that only when blood glucose levels or the glucose levels are very high do large amounts of glucose enter these cell types. GLUT3 is specific in neurons, also sperm have GLUT. GLUT3. Again, this is not glucose or uh, insulin regulated. GLUT4 is specific for skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and adipose, and it is the only insulin regulated glucose transporter. This image shows how the glucose transporter GLUT4 is constantly cycling between being on the cell surface, the membrane of the, the cell, and uh, being endocytosed and residing inside the cell on vesicles. Insulin signaling or skeletal muscle activity stimulates the process of these vesicles docking and fusing with the cell surface so that there's more GLUT4 then on the plasma membrane. So one of the ways in which insulin prevents hyperglycemia from occurring is by stimulating the amount of GLUT4 on the membranes of adipose and muscle. And this helps bring glucose levels back down after we've had a meal. Another important way of maintaining, uh, of insulin bringing blood glucose levels back down is by inhibiting the release of glucose from the liver. So what exactly is insulin? First of all, it's a peptide hormone. It's shown here in its hexameric state, so six insulin molecules associated together with the zinc in its center, and this is how it's secreted from the pancreatic beta cells. The primary trigger for its secretion is elevated blood glucose, so coming in through those GLUT2 transporters and stimulating the release of insulin from those pancreatic beta cells. And it binds to a tyrosine kinase receptor that's on the surface of essentially every cell in our body. One of the most important things to remember about insulin is that it signals that there's plenty of nutrients in our body, that it's time to build and store. It is the most potent anabolic hormone in the body. So think about what would happen to one's body without insulin. This image starkly shows what happens without insulin. If I were ever to forget what insulin does, this image comes to my mind. So what we see on the left is a girl in the 1920s who has type 1 diabetes before she had any insulin injected into her. You see she looks wasted. There's essentially no muscle and no adipose on her. This is what happens without insulin. Now she was one of the first children with type 1 diabetes that was treated with purified insulin. And what's shown on the right side is this same girl shortly after she had started insulin injections. As we discussed before in an earlier signaling lecture, insulin signaling is quite a complex process as summarized on this diagram. We'll just go through some of the key aspects here.
So here is the insulin receptor, a tyrosine kinase receptor, where insulin binds on the outside, stimulates the um, tyrosine kinase activity on the inside, and brings together lots of proteins, forming this complex network of proteins that has many different results. One is that the for adipose and muscle, GLUT4 uh, containing vesicles fuse to the plasma membrane, allowing there to be more GLUT4 on the outside of these cells and more glucose can come in. Glycolysis is stimulated in just about all cells because there's plenty of glucose around when there's lots of insulin signaling. Uh, glycogen synthesis is stimulated in most cells. In some cell types, like hepatocytes, uh, fatty acid synthesis is stimulated. In hepatocytes, gluconeogenesis, or the synthesis of glucose, um, uh, essentially the opposite of glycolysis, uh, is inhibited by insulin signaling. Additionally, insulin signaling promotes protein synthesis and inhibits the degradation of proteins. These are the, some of the uh, most important metabolic effects of insulin signaling. So insulin is the key hormone for making sure blood glucose levels don't get too high. And glucagon is the key hormone for making sure we do not become hypoglycemic. It is a key insulin counter-regulatory hormone that is high when we're fasting, as shown on this diagram here, and drops after we eat a carbohydrate-containing meal. Glucagon levels then start to rise again as blood glucose levels begin to drop and help prevent the glucose levels from dropping below about 70 mg per deciliter. Other important insulin counter-regulatory hormones are epinephrine or adrenaline, uh, cortisol, which is a key glucocorticoid, and many other stress hormones that counter the effects of insulin. Glucagon is a peptide hormone that's secreted by pancreatic alpha cells. Its secretion is triggered by low blood glucose and low insulin levels. The glucagon receptor is a G protein coupled receptor and is found primarily on hepatocytes as well as adipocytes. So this relatively stable blood glucose level that we see throughout the day is caused by uh, having different levels of secretion of insulin and glucagon. After we eat, more insulin is secreted to bring blood glucose levels back down. And when we're in a period of fasting, glucagon secretion brings blood glucose levels back up, primarily by releasing more glucose from the liver. And a healthy level of blood glucose can be maintained even if we do not eat for several weeks. So let's summarize. Blood glucose levels remain relatively constant throughout the feed fasting cycle in a healthy person. Both hypo and hyperglycemia are dangerous. A1C is the percent of hemoglobin that is glycated. It is a measure of the average blood glucose levels in the past two to three months. Blood glucose levels are primarily regulated by insulin and glucagon, plus other insulin counter-regulatory hormones like epinephrine and cortisol. And finally, insulin is the major anabolic hormone signaling to build and grow when nutrients are available.